Hi, and welcome to another episode of Start the Week with Wisdom. I'm your host, Bridget Burns, with the University Innovation Alliance. And you are on silent. Doug. Should we start again, or we just should I go for now? Go ahead and go for it. <laughs> and I, now that I'm, <laughs> you can hear me. I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed. I love it. I think that's real. It's human, and it's totally <laughs> relatable, um, which is going to be the theme of today. Is like relatable leadership. So uh, this uh, weekly wisdom is a show that we have. Um, weekly where Doug and I team up to elevate voices that we think you should be listening to that are providing leadership uh, for our industry and guiding us about the future. And we are hoping to get a select amount of their wisdom. And ideally, it's uh, positive and optimistic to help you start out with your week. So we're definitely going to get that today. And I also want to share that Weekly Wisdom is sponsored by Mainstay, which uh, you might have known them when they were known as Admit Hub. Um, it's a student engagement platform, and they uh, and retention, and they they help uh, institutions to be able to listen to their students and be able to um, to actually hold on to them to also uh, benefit from their perspective. Um, and we know that because uh, unlike a lot of products, they actually engage in peer reviewed industry research and they publish it regularly with um, with thought leaders in the field uh, like Lindsay Page. And so the one of their studies has shown that they help Georgia State increase or reduce their summer melt by 21 percent and retain 1,200 additional students with a separate study um, that they would have otherwise lost. So uh, that's just one of their studies. Feel free to check out more about Mainstay and other public other research they've conducted uh, at mainstay.com. And also one of the one, our one of our people that we're going to be interviewing today is actually on their board. So we can transition to to that. Uh, and uh, I, I think Bridget said she was going to make him sing their jingle. But yes. um, I'll, I'll let, we'll, we'll see. Um, and uh, we're joined today by somebody who's uh, been on this show before. And in addition to the other things that Bridget said, uh, today's show was going to be, it'll be fun because our guest is Michael uh, Sorrell, who's president of Paul Quinn College. Uh, and uh, welcome, Michael. And it is great to be here. It's always good to see you, Bridget and Doug. You know, this is this is a coming home moment. So it is. I'm just thrilled to hang out with you guys. We just can't wait for you to start acting like the third host, man. Like we just expect you to start showing up each week and be like, you know, asking asking different questions. Um, also, we're excited for you to test out your your pipes later on when you do the main stage angle because you're on the board. And um, I can't wait to see what it is. It's important for everyone to understand that we all have gifts. Part of life is understanding what gifts you don't have. I don't have the jingle gift. Okay, so. Well, uh, so, well, I guess we'll have to find out what wisdom you have regardless, even though this was entirely supposed to be just a vocal audition for the commercial that you were going to later film. Um, so uh, we've had you on a couple times. You're uh, a fan favorite. We hear, we always get a lot of great feedback from the audience about the wisdom that you share. And I was describing earlier, I think of you as kind of like the... Uh, executive coach for leaders in higher ed, you know, while you're also doing the actual job of leading. Um, and, and part of that is from your, informed by your background, where you actually were a crisis manager and you've done a variety of things. You worked in the private sector and otherwise. So um, I'm hoping today we can go a little bit deeper. And uh, one of the new questions that we're asking and we're, it, you know, each of these, uh, it turns out to be kind of a treasure trove depending on the person. Um, so I'm hoping it is with you. Uh, this new question is, you know, we all learn a lot about leadership from examples, um, you know, in, in addition to many other things. But I'm just curious if you have learned more from watching good examples that you want to emulate or bad examples that you want to avoid when it comes to leadership. No, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, so it depends is the most honest answer. I have learned a ton from bad leaders. I would tell you for a significant part of my career, I was exposed in, in one context to people who taught me a lot simply by the things not to do, All right? One of them was I, I had, and I'm trying to be delicate because you never know who sees these things, right? And you don't want people to be like, he's talking about me. <laughs> but 
I, I am um, in politics. I was exposed to some amazing leaders um, and amazing in ways that I thought were really, really important. The human level, people who actually cared about the people they worked with, who were funny, who were relatable, um, who were just who actually cared about the issues that they were advocating for. So those people, people like Ron Kirk, who when I met him was running for mayor of Dallas, who wound up being one of the cabinet secretaries, the trade ambassador under President Obama, um, who has become such a friend and mentor to me. He and his wife, Matrice, introduced me to my wife. Um, I learned a lot just watching his interpersonal skills, watching the way he engaged people, watching the way he spoke up and spoke truth to power. Um, but then in my own career, um, I was exposed to two extraordinary other leaders, Tom Luce and Dell Williams, who really taught me about power, who taught me how power thinks, how decisions are really made, um, and, and the power in 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 sincerity um, and, and in maintaining relationships. Uh, and also I learned a lot to, from them about how to deliver news that people won't like. I mean, they were adept at telling you things that were absolutely contrary to what you hoped for and doing it in a way where when you got done hearing the news, you were sort of like, I think I lost, but I don't feel like I lost, right? Um, but then I had some people who managed me that were really, really wonderful examples of just what not to do. And I've tried to be cognizant of those things. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, all of us have learned a lot from people who have been good and people who have been bad. And the people who have been bad, the, the trick is not to stay so long around them that you become bitter, that you take them for what they can provide, learn the lesson, learn the exposure, and use that as you move forward. And I think that's, that's good for other, because the one other thing too that I'll add to this is sometimes you can learn the good and the bad lessons from the same people. It depends upon the season in which you're exposed to them, right? Great leaders coming out of traumatic situations who haven't processed their own trauma can traumatize others. Now, if you caught them maybe prior to that trauma, they may have been spectacular, but it really does depend where you are in your life. How are you managing what you're going through? I mean, you know, I would imagine someone who's gone through a divorce is going to be at a different place than someone who just had their first child in a happy marriage. Leadership isn't just your own individualized experience. It's, it's what else is going on in your world. Are there, are there commonalities, uh, without, again, without naming names, get me in trouble, are there commonalities in the, the traits that you've learned from the bad examples? Or are there, in other words, are there certain things that were either consistent across them or the biggest, the biggest mistakes or, or things you learned not to do? Yeah, selfishness. Selfishness by far was the singular connecting trait for bad leadership. Um, I often tell people, um, one of my leadership lessons is you cannot love people you do not love, and you should never lead people you do not know, right? If you, because the sacrifice is required to truly lead people, to truly manage someone effectively, requires selfless behavior. You have to be at a space where you can put others' needs before your own. And if we are honest with ourselves, we can't always do that, right? You have to be in a certain frame of mind, a certain emotional stature, or emotional state to allow you to move beyond your own personal agendas to adequately care for others. One of the things that I try and do is I, I try and be honest with my staff about where I am 
emotionally. You know, like I've gone through periods where I was like, look, y'all, I'm just tired. I'm tired. I, I, I need I need a moment. And I've got to I've got to have the ability to find a way to rejuvenate myself while still doing my job. And depending upon your leadership model, that may or may not be possible. I think for a lot of people who have built up these personas where they're always right or, you know, they're never people that can be questioned or in or invulnerable. Or right. that's see that's because I, I don't know if that's a, a little bit of what I'm hearing from you is sort of a, I mean we talk about acknowledging that you're tired or whatever I mean um, being able to show vulnerability I think is really an important trait. Oh, I, I, Doug, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I had something happen to me here once where one of my really good friends died of cancer, and he left a wife and two young sons, and. His wife is a wonderful woman. You know, we're, we're friends, like adore her. But you take that father out of the equation. Now, those boys are going to have a very different life. No matter what the rest of us do, no matter how we try and stand in the gap, no matter what it is, that's their dad. So as someone who is a father of young children, and I think at the time he died, we hadn't yet had my daughter. So it was just my son. And I was in my staff meeting with the entire staff of the college. And I'm telling them, look, I, I really need you to pray for my friend. You know, he's sick, he's dying, blah, blah, blah. And I just broke down in tears, right? Just put my head down and broke down in tears. Now, some of that is because of having survived my own brush with death. But the rest of it is because I know what it's like to lose your dad. I lost my dad in college. I, I know it's like to, I lost my mom, you know, when I was a young professional. And those moments change you. And they're scary. And cancer is terrifying. And, and all of these things. And he was a good man. And to see what he went through. And my staff was so amazing in that moment, right? People came up, they put their arms on me, they hugged me, they prayed over me. And, you know, listen, that's a gift, right? Like my staff gave me a gift. What they said to me in that moment is, we authentically love you and we care for you. And to your point about vulnerability, um, I try to honor that by always just being authentically vulnerable in myself. And one piece of advice I would give to more leaders out there is people actually want to know you. You know, like your staff, the people following your students, they want to know you, not the trumped up version of you, not the version of you that is impenetrable, right? No, the version of you that might not have it all together because none of us have it all together. Right. Listen, I am grateful every day when my clothes match. Right. Like, I mean, we, we that's why I wear lots of solids. Right. Like it's hard to mess those up. But it is um, it, it's really important that we just be human. I love it. I think that's excellent and um, time tested advice. I, I do want to go in on one part of what you just said, though, because I can tell people are going to have questions about it. Because uh, this idea of being able to deliver hard news in a, in a soft way, um, boy, talk about a topic that everybody's like, oh, what did you learn? Um, so can you share your advice for doing that that you've gleaned from, uh, from this other leader? Sure. Well, the first thing is tell people the truth when as soon as you can tell them. You do no one any favors dragging out the truth, all right? And, and then also understand the temporal nature of delivering bad news. You're not always going to have to deliver tough news, right? Like there is a moment in time where you have to deliver that, and then, it, then you move on. You don't have to wallow in that place. So for me, you know, and, and listen— when I was younger, I would deliver the bad news and I would be smiling, right? And I learned that that didn't really work because then people weren't hearing what I was saying 
or the severity of what I was saying, because they were kind of like, well, if it was that bad, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be pleasant. So what I've learned to do is just to sit people down and say, listen, this is what it is. Now, you don't have to love it. You don't even have to like it. But this is the reality of this moment in time. Now, I'm happy to answer any questions. Happy to help you work through whatever else you have to work through. But this part of our conversation, this won't change. So let's let's talk about what we need to talk about. But, you know, I'll help you in any way I can, but that does not negate the fact that a change needs to be made or we have not performed where we are or you haven't been who you need to be. I think you tell people directly um, and then you let them know the moment, like this isn't for the rest of their lives, right? This is a chapter. This is a page. Whether or not it becomes the rest of your life is entirely dependent upon them. How do you process this? How do you accept this? How do you move forward with it? That's great. Um, oh, so let me oh, yeah. add one thing, Doug. Sorry about that. That's right. This this part I think doesn't get talked about enough. Don't be afraid of the silence. Yeah. So we we have a tendency to when you deliver difficult news, and and then there's that silence. People get nervous and want to fill the silence, and they and typically what they fill the silence with doesn't help them in the long run. Say it. Let people sit with it. Don't feel pressure to fill the silence and then move on. Yeah. When um, to build on that, I had an executive coach who once told me like, hey, Bridget, you don't, you know, uh, when people, when your team offers something or people give you, you know, especially hard stuff when they, when they share it with you, you don't have to respond. You just have to listen. You can just shut up and just hold, just be there. And it was such a, like such a gift because now I don't feel like I have to always know all the answers. And in fact, uh, my role, my, my leadership in that moment is, is really listening, but, but that is, you do not get me to, I'm not going to react to that. I'm not, like, I am going to listen. Uh, and, and that, um, that's been quite freeing. And I've given it to many other people who are like, oh my God, you really don't have to respond. You don't have to say anything. No. I mean, eventually, eventually you, you can, but like, in the moment, you do not have to actually have like a canned response or anticipate everything. Um, your job is to listen. You know who taught me that? My wife. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> like my wife. My wife told me, she's like, I don't need you to solve every problem. I just need you to listen. And it there's, was there's... it was oddly freeing, right? Because you put a lot of pressure on yourself to kind of be the guy, right? And sometimes yeah. being the guy is being the guy with the small G, not the big right. G. Right. Well, that's where I was going. I think there that is a uh, that's a tend to that think that tends to be a guy thing to some extent, uh, a, a male oh, thing. In, uh, in relation and, to yeah, and yeah, it's a hard lesson to learn, but it works in the workplace too. Yeah. yeah. Well, back to the workplace. Um, uh, so we had talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, that one of the things that we consistently hear. That is the hardest thing, um, but is the thing that higher ed needs to be able to master. We expect people to know how to do it, uh, but nobody enjoys it. Well, that I know, and that's managing people. It is, uh, we seem to assume that by being managed, you have learned how to do it through osmosis, even though most of us have been poorly managed and the examples we have are great. And so what I'm wondering is, um, you know, as the president of a college, your job is not necessarily doing day-to-day -day people management, but in order to get here, you probably had to master it so that you could actually delegate it. And I'm just wondering uh, if there were any particular moments in your career or experiences that you learned how to manage people from the most. So I want to throw a curve into what you asked, and I want to turn it around as a question a bit. Can you be a great manager while also being a great husband and father? 
And I don't know if you can. And I say that because what makes great managers is time, right? It takes time to manage people. You need to be present. You need to be engaged. But to be a great father, it takes time. You must be present. You must be engaged. To be a great husband takes time. You must be present and you must be engaged. So now there are three separate units that need your time. Your job, your children, your wife. How do you resolve that tension? Now, be, be just a mediocre manager, or just be okay with being an okay manager. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but for lots of people, the people who pay the price are their family. It's the family, right? The wife, the wife, the kids, because there will be a moment in your marriage where your wife needs your attention or your husband needs your attention more. Far too many of us miss those moments. And the price of missing those moments sometimes is, is divorce, right? Or the inability to ever return to the happiest state of your marriage. The price of missing the time that your child needs. Because children don't need you when you want them to need you. They need you when they need you, right? And so, I, like, I think about this, you know, and I'm just being very transparent. I spend a lot of time with my son. And when I'm with my son, a lot of times we're in the car. I don't, I work very hard not to be on the phone when my son is in the car. Because, I, you know, sometimes he's doing his homework and that, that would be disruptive. But sometimes it's just he needs his dad. That means that I have to condense the time that I have to manage. So here's how I've solved that. In my early in my presidency, I was I was here all the time, right? I the students, like, you know, they knew they could come to my office sometimes eight, nine o'clock at night. I'd be here, we'd sit, we'd talk. Same thing with staff. I got married. Well, you can't stay at work all night long and hope that the marriage works well. We got pregnant on our honeymoon. Well, now, nine months later, we've got a baby. I remember being here because we were in crisis mode when my child, like mad, angry, because I've got a baby at home that I can't go be with. So as we grew as an institution, and my managing my management responsibility started to grow. I realized the only shot that I had at being able to be the father that I wanted to be, the husband that I wanted to be, and the college president I wanted to be, was that I was going to have to reduce the number of people that I was managing. I was going to have to find people who could be managed in my preferred style, and that is critically important. So. Part of being an effective manager is understanding your management love language, right? Understanding the kinds of people that you manage best. As a president, I don't need to manage 85 separate people. I need to be an effective manager of my core group and empower them to manage effectively their direct reports thereby giving me the best chance of being a great manager and college president and still having the ability to be a great father and husband. But it took me a minute to figure that out. Are there any experiences that you had or professional development or, I don't know, coaching or whatever that actually helped you figure that, man that language out? Um, or any, I guess, and it, we can open beyond management, 
I'm just curious about, because you've probably been recruited into everything under the sun, but um, at some point in your career, especially, um, you know, as a president, um, are there any things that you think were actually like really worth it? Um, so I've never really had an executive coach. Um, and I, you know, I'm a little envious of people who have, right? Um, we, you know, it's hard. I understand the argument for why you use institutional resources to do it. I just can always justify the institutional resources being used on behalf of other people than myself. So that requires me to be far more self-critical, to be far more reflective, and to really work at, you know, being humble and hu like having the humility to ask people to help provide critical feedback of my performance and what I do. Um, so I try really hard just to, to listen, um, to create opportunities for people to give me critical feedback. Um, you know, and then I, I'm very fortunate. I have friends like you, Bridget, where you and I talk about stuff, you know, where, you know, like I, I, I've got a handful of close friends in higher education. Um, literally, they could, the closest ones could fit on one hand, um, that I can just be human with. And they provide professional development. I, I also, early on in my presidency, I just would go visit other schools and other presidents and I'd listen. I don't get to do that as much anymore because, you know, those that was time that now I have to spend with the kids. Um, but if I could offer this piece of advice to people, find your version of an executive coach. And if it's not a singular traditional executive coach, then find your own personal cabinet. Find people who you can call up and they will they will talk to you. Right? Like never get so caught up in your own self-importance that you forget that at the end of the day, all of us need people around us who will speak truth to us. And it is really hard for the people who speak truth to you to be people that you pay. Totally. Right? I, On your staff. I don't think that works. 100%. I love this advice, the personal cabinet. Um, you're in my cabinet too. Uh, you both, I talk to you all the time about this kind of stuff, about like how to actually navigate messy things. Um, I wanted to share that um, I didn't have resources. Actually, I did get resources early, I think from a Gates grant um, when we were first starting. And, um, you know, I tried the traditional kind, but I ended up finding that what was most useful for me was finding someone who I really respected, who had done a similar job that retired. Um, and so I actually sought out, um, well, I don't even know, shout out, but the former head of the uh, Big Ten Academic Alliance. Um, I was like, you, she was the person who I had called when building the alliance to figure out like, how do I come up with bylaws? How do I build all these things? And uh, when she retired, I was like, I have a job for you. <laughs> it's just, you're the person I call that I can talk about all the stuff that I can't talk about with my team. And you're going to help me like process and figure it out. And um, so that's one. But the other is uh, there are, there's so much of a wealth of, um, podcasts out there, if you find that you can construct yeah. your own virtual cabinet, like, I mean, Oprah doesn't know she's in my ear. Brene Brown doesn't know she's in my ear. All these like, uh, coaching for leaders is a podcast that I highly right. recommend that has an episode about everything you could possibly experience in leadership or management and really high quality. And, um, so I'm always sharing those in our newsletter, but like, you know, I have my free <laughs> zero cost executive coaches that when I walk to work, I try and listen to a podcast that um, helps me think about something different. So, um, or I call you and vent. And that makes, <laughs> that makes such a difference, right? Like, I mean, it, it is, it's so important to have people who will talk to you. Right. And that's different than mentors, right? Mentors advise you. 
but you need people that you can have an exchange with in like in a more interpersonal level. Like there are some really good mentors. Like I, I do, but I'm very fortunate with the people and, and I view mentoring differently. Right. I'm mm -hmm. sort of like, listen, if you answer my email, if you answer my phone call, you are mentoring me. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, you don't have to have any fun. If I'm just like, hey, how would you? Got it. Thank you. Um, but I don't think it's a one size fits all. I, I think that people really have to figure out, well, this is what works for me. Yeah. Well, I think that's the perfect way for us to end things today. I think this is uh, um, a great show where we got to go a little bit deeper and um, elevate your perspective and leadership. And I hope that this has been helpful for the audience. Uh, Doug, I can see you taking notes and like, I can see your, 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 your ideas <laughs> popping around. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I was just thinking that I'm like, I'm, t I'm too old to learn new tricks. I'm like, I'm past it. Like, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm what I am, but uh, we can always get better. I think. <laughs> well, that's, I guess one of the things I would say about executive coaching is it's far more frequently venting. It's, 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 it's about helping you process so you don't process on your team or in front of that, you know, and get to uh, having, and also because your spouse or partner or uh, someone in your, in your personal life, they're free labor. Uh, they don't want to be your free therapist. <laughs> you know, I, let me add this. This is a really unusual one. I actually had a student who was incredibly helpful to me on this front. She was a bit older um, and we, we had this really interesting dynamic. She, um, she interned for me and she was the worst intern I ever had, right? Like I'll never forget, she and I had a conversation. I was sitting in the airport in Norfolk and I, like I had a six hour gap, right? And so I was like, call, I said, listen, you're one of my favorite people, but you are absolutely by far the worst intern I've ever had. And it turned out that she was incredibly coachable. And so then there was a point where I was struggling with some things on campus and she, she pulled me, she said, she said, listen, you are incredibly gifted. The problem is you can't be every place. And because you can't be, the places where you aren't focused on suffer. And the people in those places suffer because you haven't figured out how to manage through those scenarios. And she's like, and we're not going to be who we can be as a college until you figure that out. And, you know, we were joking. I was like, thank you. Now I'm going to take all your financial aid away. Right. Like, and we laughed about it, you know, <laughs> like, you know, but, but she like, cause she knew I was joking, but it was fantastic coaching advice. Mm. Right. Absolutely fantastic coaching advice. And this part, I, you know, I know we're running long, but I just have to add as a president, you better figure out how to listen to your students. You better figure out how not to have their real opinions be filtered. The students have to be comfortable enough to tell you what they really think and how they really feel. Your staff will interpret what the students tell them. And they will give you what they tell them in a way that may, not necessarily intentionally, but may cover up some of their own failings. Right? That's human nature. I'm not saying they're bad people. Your students need, and this is in any business you're in, your customers, your clients, whoever it is, you better figure out how to create an avenue for real dialogue. And then you've got to sit back on your ego and be humble enough to hear it and to be appreciative of it and to listen to it in a way that encourages people to keep sharing with you. And I'm not telling you that that's easy, but I'm telling you that that's incredibly necessary. And that's all I got. 
That is it. I think you mic drop at that moment. That's the perfect <laughs> ending for the day. So um, between now and then, well, uh, this this episode is going to air uh, the first day of ASU GSV, which you, uh, the three of us will be at. So we'll be kicking it. So I'll see you all there. And otherwise, for folks at home, we will see you next week. Thanks so much. All right.